Hey, thank you. I'm just going to give a, a pictorial recap of that, of that background. So uh, 2007 to 2015, uh, this was a short, you know, uh, hour and a half, two hour drive from, from where I worked in Australia. And uh, Amir, we, we, we tried very hard uh, to attract Amir down to Australia. Amir, this is what you were missing. Uh, <laughs> uh, Toronto's nice, but I mean, you know, you can't deny that this was uh, pretty nice. Anyway, I spent, um, did my PhD here at U of T in Comp Sci. Uh, I spent um, almost nine lovely years in Australia. Uh, I love the beach, and so if you like beaches, you want to go to Australia. Um, and uh, so, but then uh, I, I worked for an organization that's sort of um, very much like the Vector Institute, which unfortunately uh, ended around 2015. And so then I moved on to uh, Oregon State. And you know, I like beaches, and so here's the beach in Oregon. It's a little rainier, uh, a little rougher. Um, you probably don't want to go in here without a wetsuit. Um, so it was nice, but not what I was used to. So. Uh, then colleagues in industrial engineering at Toronto said, hey, we have, an, we have an opening, do you want to apply? I said, sure, so this is my new beach. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure how much the quality of beaches has improved since I left Australia, uh, but certainly it's amazing to be back here at, 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 at U of T. Okay, so just, uh, I, I, this talk is about recommendation. Uh, that's a one fraction of what I do, and I'm not going to talk about the rest of what I do uh, here, except to say very briefly that I do a lot of things. Um, so I, I would consider myself a computer scientist by training in that I'm applying you know, broad techniques from AI, machine and deep learning, uh, RL, MDPs, and POMDPs. My, my thesis was you know, more in the, in the MDP area. Um, uh, also, information retrieval. When I went to Australia, there were some great IR groups there. I got into that. And, and user interfaces. So these are sort of my, 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 my horizontals, my, my techniques. And, and as an industrial engineer, right, my, my goal, and the goal of industrial engineering, for those of you who don't know what it is, right, as I probably didn't when I applied, uh, is that you know, we, 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 we take these tools to our toolbox uh, and we apply them to industrial applications. Uh, and so it's e-commerce recommendation. Uh, social media has uses in lots of industry. Uh, health, HVAC, uh, so uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, traffic signal control, finance, network security, all these techniques right, have some use here uh, for these verticals. In industrial engineering, we largely focus on the application uh, of these techniques for industry. Um, so what do I do? That's, that's one slide, uh, a lot more than just recommendation, but uh, I can only talk about one thing today, so I'm going to focus on, on recommendation, uh, mostly, on, uh, uh, mostly on, on recognition itself, a little bit on the overlap with uh, the use of social media. Um, and just as a quick question, so who in the audience is familiar with recommendation and or collaborative filtering techniques? Okay, so I'll try to provide implicit refresher for those who uh, haven't worked in this area so much. Okay, and I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to derail initially with a tangent, uh, but you'll see how this is related to the main point of the talk uh, as it continues. So I'm going to talk about doing social cold start recommendation with positively feedback. If you don't know what all those phrases mean here, I'll explain it in a second. Okay, so we want to, I, I work with Kobo uh, here in Toronto. Who, who has a Kobo reader? Who has a Kindle? Ah, oh, bad Canadians. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, we work with Kobo here in Toronto. They, 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 they make e-readers. Um, and we worked on book recommendations. So uh, here we have users in the rows, and we have books in the columns. And we have a one if the user has purchased uh, uh, a book. So you'll note here that I have purchased uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, certainly my favorite book. Um, you may have others. Uh, and so the idea is, well, you know, Joseph here and Nguyen, who worked on this uh, paper, uh, they, they didn't like Fifty Shades of Grey. And so the question is, should I recommend this to them? Uh, and so that's the idea of clever filtering. I don't need to know anything about the users. I don't need to know anything about the item space or the books. I just need to know who's purchased what. And you might look here and you say, well, uh, would I be more likely to recommend Fifty Shades of Grey to Nguyen or Joseph? Well, I can look at how similar I am to Nguyen. We've overlapped on one book purchase. And Joseph, we've overlapped, overlapped on two book purchases. So off this sort of very weak signal, you might say, might be more, you might be more likely to recommend Fifty Shades of Grey to Joseph 
uh, because he looks a little bit more similar uh, to me. And that's the idea of clever filtering. You don't need any information about the users and items, you just need this matrix. If you're comparing users sim similarity, that's called user-based clever filtering. If you're comparing item similarity, that's called item-based clever filtering. And you know, very simple nearest neighbor techniques uh, were used in the Netflix competition and were part of the final ensemble that, uh, that did win. Um, OK, but the story is more complex. So with Kobo, they know when you've purchased uh, a book. Uh, but for all the books you didn't purchase, right, the question is, did you explicitly not purchase it because you didn't like it, or did you not simply know about it? So for Netflix, it was a little bit easier. If you remember the Netflix competition, they, people rated movies. So I, if I rated a movie one, I didn't like it. If I rated a five, I liked it. Uh, in this setting, uh, and this is closer to most e-commerce cases, uh, you don't have explicit negative feedback. Um, so, that, so, so the first problem here is you, you have positive-only data. And uh, this will lead to some nice techniques later, uh, developed actually just this past summer with my student in layer six. Uh, so I'll come back to this a bit later. Uh, the other problem here is that if you look at Suvash here in the bottom, main author on this paper, uh, he's just joined Kobo. He has not actually purchased anything yet. So if we don't have any side information for users, we don't have side information for books, how the heck do we possibly recommend for Suvash? Right? Well, in this case, you do what most, most companies do, and they just sort of give you the most popular list of books because they know nothing else about you. Um, you may do it by demographic, you know, for males in their 20s or something, uh, but typically you don't have the information to do more than that. Uh, so the second problem is called cold start, right? Uh, we have a new user, and for Kobo, losing these users, right, so many people join the platform, they don't purchase a book, and they never see them again, right? So losing these users is quite costly. Once you buy one book, you're very, uh, your chance of buying an, uh, uh, another book have increased substantially. Uh, so Kobo would like, to re would like to recommend well for these cold start users and uh, then retain them. Okay? So now you might say we're, we're going to need some side information in order to, in order to recommend for, uh, for Suvash, and, and that's where the social part comes in. So in the, in the user item space, we don't have any information for Suvash here. However, uh, Kobo allows you to log in with your Facebook login. Is that just for convenience? Just so you don't have to remember another password. No, because they're going to ask for permissions, right, to see certain things on your Facebook page as you log in, right? It gives, it gives Kobo more data. Uh, one, thing they'll, one thing they'll ask for, which may seem innocuous to you, but be w warned, uh, they'll ask for your page likes, right? Uh, up until 2015, if you clicked on a link that was a page, Facebook would make you automatically like it. So effectively, up, up, up until 2015, uh, the page likes were tracking your clicks. Like, you know, basically, did you, are you a member of the Justin Bieber fan club? Or are you a member of the NICTA organization? Uh, you know, there are <laughs> billions of pages, literally, uh, on Facebook. And clicking on a link would allow you to like it. And our data at this time did have that. Uh, we did have those clicks. As of 2015, people started to complain that this was effectively allowing Facebook to track their clicks. And so Facebook stopped, uh, stopped having a click being a page. Like, now you actually have to officially click like on a page in order to like it. Uh, so the data is a bit more sparse than it used to be, but uh, still quite useful. So we do have, you know, so Suvash logged in with his Facebook login, like the rest of us, and so we, we have page likes now for all of us. And you might say, well, okay, now I can look at similarity in this space and try to transfer it to the book recommendation. That's probably the first thing you do. It's a good idea. It doesn't actually work that well. Um, so we can be a little bit more intelligent about how we leverage the social data. So I'm going to jump to the solution. Um, and, it won't, and I'm going to explain in a few moments why the solution actually works, but let me just explain the details of how it works first. Uh, so we have uh, these target users. These target users, uh, like Suvash, have only liked pages on Facebook. We don't have any book purchases for, uh, for the target users. We just have their social page likes. However, for a set of training users, uh, we not only have their page likes, Right? We also have their uh, purchases. Right? So we have both page information and item information for our training users. Now our ultimate goal is to predict uh, how much we think every target user in the rows is going to like an, a, a, an item in the column. And if you just sort of multiply through these matrices, right, the P's cancel, the U trains cancel, and you see you do semantically get a matrix that, that will give you some, uh, some score for every item and target user. 
Um, now, there are many, many explanations for why this makes sense. Uh, you know, one thing that you can do is you can view the matrix multiply as a marginalization operation. It turns out this is actually just a very simple chain graphical model that we're marginalizing in. Uh, but a more intuitive view for recommendation is this. If you multiply these two matrices, what you get effectively is a page item similarity matrix. Right? In every column here, you're going to count them. Because uh, what we're going to do is, remember there's a one here if, you, if a user purchased the item. For all the question marks, we're just now going to put zeros there. So these are just zero, one matrices. And when we take the dot product, we're effectively counting the number of users who've liked page P and also liked item I. Um, so we're basically building some, simil some similarity matrix uh, between pages and items. Uh, and so on the previous slide, right here I said you don't want to just look at pure similarity in the, in the page-like space. You kind of want to look at how the pages relate to the items. And this is a much better way to do it. Uh, now another way to interpret this is that basically we're, we're for every item we're building like a page centroid. Right? We're averaging all the page vectors uh, for users. Um, and we're sort of building a page centroid. And what this turns out to be is actually very similar to a, uh, a nearest neighbor Rokio-based classifier, where you kind of build a centroid for each prototype class. And then for a user, you say, well, they have this page vector. How, how close is their page vector to the centroid for every item? And so it turns out what we're doing is matrix multiplies. We're actually implicitly doing sort of a nearest neighbor centroid-based uh, method. Um, and so. We published this in Ruxus 2014, very simple method. Um, you might say, well, it's near stable. Like, like we could learn more. And don't worry, this talk will be about learning. So we'll, we'll, we'll go beyond this. But the feedback we got from Rexis was that this is great for industry because their engineers can go implement this quite easily. Right? They understand it. They can implement it. It's just matrix multiplies. It's, it's very fast. Um, so this did get a fair amount of uptake. Uh, finally, you might wonder what these stars are doing. Uh, just empirically, we found if we replace your uh, inner product from a matrix multiply with more like a cosine similarity, so normalize your vectors first, uh, we would get better results. And when you do look at the centroid-based sim similarity view, that, does, that, definitely, that definitely suggests why you want to do things like cosine similarity instead. OK. Now, the final thing is, is yep. Um, uh, we replaced all of our non-purchases with zeros, which is not always a good thing to do. However, Elkin and Noto, in a very nice, simple paper from KDD 2008, point out that if you're ranking, if you wanted, if you wanted to make a probabilistically calibrated classifier, uh, you would not uh, impute all the missings with zeros. You'd have to be smarter. But if you're ranking, uh, they make a nice argument uh, that uh, imputing zeros for the unobserved entries is actually fairly safe for ranking. Uh, at the end of the day, when we're doing recommendation, right? If I give, you know, I, I can't say I like. I think you like these billion books, right? You don't have time to look at those billion books, right? I give you a ranked list, just like Google. Uh, so when you're ranking, uh, it turns out that imputing zeros is fairly safe, but you can do better. And I will come back to this later. Okay, so very simple method. Uh, does it work? Just quickly, uh, if you look at things like precision at one, how likely were, were we to get the first item? Uh, how likely was the user to actually purchase the first item we recommended? Uh, I mean, the numbers are quite low because people don't purchase a whole lot. Uh, but you do get six times uh, uh, the purchase rate uh, over just the most popular sort of user independent approach. And even if you look at demographics uh, or the friend network, you still do three times as well. And if you look at general ranking metrics, not just the precision at one, but mean average precision, a general ranking metric used in the literature. Uh, you're still about two to three times better than the uh, competing methods. Um, now, one final note. You know, Stubash worked on this for uh, a solid uh, year and got nowhere. You know, and he was quite demoralized. He's a year into his PhD, and nothing's working out. And you know, most PhD students want to switch topics at that time. <laughs> uh, and he he came back to me after a year, though. He said, actually, he said, I got it to work. I said, OK, but you know, did you find a bug? You know, it just didn't suddenly work overnight, because you found the right random number. Uh, like, why is it working? He said, actually, it's very simple. He said, I was looking at a lot of the, um, I was looking at a lot of the, of, of the books we had from the Kobo data set. Um, and I started looking at their titles. And I find that there were things like, like Pride and Prejudice, or books by Mark Twain. Right? So these books published over 75 years ago. What's interesting about them? 
They're out of, they're free. They're, they're out of copyright, they're free. Do you think people will load books onto their Kindle or Kobo reader if they're, do you think they have the same behavior for loading free books versus purchasing books? Clearly not. If you're me, you're just like, oh, free, just load it on, you know? Uh, I may not read it, but there's no cost to me to, to get it, right? And so, so Subash realized when we, so we didn't have the price column for the books. And he went back and he asked, he asked uh, my colleague Darius at Kobo, he said, can, can we get the price column? Uh, and uh, basically there were two very different behaviors between purchase, book purchasing and the free books. And once he admitted all the free books, then we did very well uh, and we saw the improvements at recommending for purchases, which makes sense. We, 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 were mix, we were mixing two types of behavior, right? And these models weren't smart enough to pick that up. Uh, okay. So you know, a little data science, a little investigation of your error cases will we'll, 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 we'll go a long way. Okay, finally, this is, this is just, you'll find this interesting in the end, and, and another side note. Um, I mentioned that, you know, page looks seem innocuous, right? Um, the, 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 the page on Facebook. Turns out this is some of the most useful information you have. Turns out your friends are useless, sorry. Uh, but your page likes, if I could pay for one thing, it wouldn't be your friends, it would be your page likes. So in the same year we published this work, we had some other work on page likes as well, and we published in 2013. Same year, some folks uh, at eBay said, actually, page likes predict user purchase behavior on eBay. Um, it turns out, and you'll see this in a second, even though I called it Rokio Central Based Classifier, there's also a very nice, clean autoencoder view of what we did. Okay, so let me, and that's going to then lead the way to learning and deep learning. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's forget the, the social cold start aspect. Let's just go back to standard recommendation where for our trained users we have, we have items that they've purchased and false over the target users we have items uh, that they've purchased. So this is just the standard recommendation case uh, where all users have at least one thing that they've purchased. So no, no cold start. And there's no side information here. And then again, you multiply these two matrices and what you'll find is the item item similarity matrix. Um, and so if you just do the matrix multiply here, right, you'll see that every user and item, right, the score of every user and item here in this matrix uh, turns out to be the simple calculation. For a given user, I'm going to look at all items J, how similar was item I to item J from this matrix, and did they purchase item J? Right. And if you know standard near simple cloud filtering, this is exactly the sort of uh, equation that you do. You know, I don't know if the user purchased item I, but I know if they purchased J, and I have a, now a similar measure of how similar the items were. Again, this is item-based cloud filtering. You can also do the user-based version uh, if you want to look at user similarity. Now, if you know the Bell and Corn work that was used in Netflix, uh, you might say this is actually not quite what they used, right? They actually renormalized uh, this expression by the sum of all the weights, which of course makes a lot of sense, right? But we don't need to for Kobo, and actually this actually hurts us. So the question is, but, but the Netflix folks had to do this. So for anyone who might know collaborative filtering, why did Netflix have to renormalize by the sum? What, what was the Netflix metric for Evaluation. It was root. It was root. Yeah, root, root mean squared error, right, of the score prediction. And of course, if you don't, you know, if your scores are between, if you place repur, if you replace purchase with score and score between one to five, and you do a weighted average, of course, you're going to have to divide by the weights to get a number between one to five. You know, predicting ten thousand is not a very good score if the max was five. So for Netflix, when you're doing one to five rating recommendation, you absolutely have to renormalize. Uh, however, uh, we're not doing rating, so we, we don't care about RMSC. Uh, and by the way, neither does Netflix. They said, you know, you know, competition was great, but the one thing we realized after the competition was that RMSC doesn't help us do our job. It doesn't help us retain users. Uh, so Netflix doesn't even use RMSC, even though that was used, used in their competition. Um, uh, so for Kobo, we're ranking, right? We're going to show the user, we think you should buy these 10 books, or we're going to recommend, recommend these 10 books to you. And it turns out that when you're doing ranking, you don't really want to renormalize. Um, you don't have to. You're, you're just sorting by the highest scores. 
And in fact, uh, now that my colleague Darius has moved on from Kobo to TD Bank, uh, I can now relate a story of, of how dangerous it can be to, re to, re to, re to renormalize. Um, I should ask, is this recording public? Um, as public as you want it to be. Okay, yeah. Okay, I, I'm not going to mention uh, the offensive book or the offensive population uh, that was offended by the book. Um, but uh, they got some really upset emails from people saying, uh, why did you recommend uh, this book to me? This is absolutely offensive. And you can ask me offline. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I won't tell you what it is. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so, so you know, my colleague Darius, he went back, he looked, he looked at, the, at the recommender, which at that time did normalize, because that's what Bell and Corrin did. And he realized what happened was this book no one purchased. Right? Or maybe like one, one very odd person purchased it. So what happened was the similarities between this book and all other books were close to zero. Right? Uh, but as soon as you divide by some of the weights, that book, which no one likes, suddenly pops up way in score right? uh, randomly. So in fact, when you're ranking, right, this, this renormalization can actually promote books that have no similarity whatsoever to anything else. And so this book, which was really quite offensive and no one liked, then suddenly got recommended to a bunch of people. Um, so that's when Darius realized, OK, we need to remove this. We're ranking. We don't need to do this. And they actually also improved their overall recommendation substantially. So small but important detail. OK, so that's the relation between Bell and Korn. Near, you know, so we, we, had, we had like a centroid-based interpretation of this. Now we have a, a nearest neighbor Bell and Korn-style interpretation. There's yet a third interpretation. Uh, and this is called LREC, so it's a linear autoencoding view of recommendation. If you think about it, this, let's, let's say that we fix the target uh, um, user item matrix and we fix the matrix here as well. In fact, we, uh, I, should, I, I should say we probably should throw the train users. Uh, we, we, we can, because we now have item likes for uh, both train and target. We can throw the train users in here as well and the train users here. Uh, so let's make these two matrices the same and say well, we're just kind of actually trying to learn the similarity matrix, right, that will map, right, this matrix to that one. Um, now, you might say, well, uh, wouldn't the identity matrix uh, actually give me a perfect mapping? Uh, it would, but let's, let's take another view. So, Let's look at every column here. Call this the Y column. Look at every column here. Call this the weight column, W. And so now we have uh, some matrix uh, Q, right, times some weight vector will give us some labels. So you can actually train every column of this matrix as if it were an independent uh, linear regression for every column here. Uh, or logistic regression if you're doing uh, sort of 0, 1, uh, classification. Okay. And that's sort of the, the, the LREC perspective. We're, we're using uh, linear predictors, right? things like linear regression or logistic regression, to learn every weight column individually. Because this weight column corresponds to this label column. And this weight column on the right corresponds to this label column on the right. So if we have 100 items, we have to do 100 different linear regressions or logistic regressions, which is fairly fast to do with any modern machine. And so what view of recommendation does this give you? It actually gives you a, it, we're actually, we actually have an autoencoder, right? We're trying to learn the similarity matrix that allows us to re-encode uh, the input matrix as the output matrix. Now again, back to the answer of why is the identity matrix not the, uh, not the best solution? Well, when you use linear or logistic regression, we know we have to regularize to overfit. Uh, and when we regularize uh, the learning, uh, it becomes very expensive to put one's on the diagonal, right? In fact, uh, the learning will tend to spread out the weights among the column to try to leverage the other information with lower weights to reproduce uh, this matrix. So just by regularizing the overfitting, you wouldn't get the identity matrix as a solution. You actually get a fairly useful similarity matrix that you can learn directly from the data. Okay? Again, so we can learn that with, with linear or logistic regression. This is exactly a linear autoencoder. Um, it's convex, right? So unlike matrix factorization, which you may be familiar with, uh, this is a purely convex uh, op op optimization. Like we, we can find the globally optimal solution. 
Um, again, we don't get the identity, right, we, because we are regularizing to, to prevent overfitting. Uh, and finally, um, it turns out in practice, I'll show, you, I'll show you the results here in a minute, even though we sort of have a classification problem, will a user purchase a book or not? Remember, we're actually not doing classification, we're doing ranking. And although I would never recommend linear regression for classification, right, it's the wrong loss function, when you're ranking, uh, variants of the L2 loss, um, a truncated version, are actually shown to be very good uh, for ranking problems. Of course, the nice thing about linear regression is we can compute it efficiently in closed form. We don't even need to do uh, a gradient op 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 optimization most of the time. So, so this linear autocoding view has some very nice properties, and it works very well for ranking. So I think that's my next, OK. That's, so results come up in one slide. Finally, uh, we're not doing side information anymore with cold start, but if you had, if you had page likes, then you would just uh, append the page likes to the, as more rows and items. If you had demographics, you, 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 you would um, append the, de the, 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 the demographic information as more rows and items. So uh, this view, because of the previous perspective, also uh, admits all the side information that you might get as well. Um, if you have it, just throw it in. Let the system learn what the similarities are right, to predict. Right? So it's sort of like a similar, similar learning version of uh, the Bell and Corrin work, which, which was quite nice for us. OK. So empirically, we have uh, four data sets. We have a, you know, a ton of standard uh, rec recognition methods. Uh, but I'm really only looking at the, the new methods with this linear autocoder view are the three right columns. Uh, and the simple linear approach works surprisingly well across uh, four different data sets. It's very efficient, very scalable, um, and it's, you know, it's basically beating uh, matrix factorization, uh, k-nearest neighbor methods, um, et cetera. Okay. And this, so it, it's, just, it, it's a global optimization, right? It's a, it's a, uh, so it's very effective and efficient practice. So this was nice. Um, but one problem you might notice back here is that we have to do a linear regression or a, a logistic regression for every single column. And if you have a billion items, that's where you start to run into computational problems. I mean, a million is actually, a million linear regressions, you know, is still pretty fast. A billion is where you run into problems. So then Suvash, after doing this work with Kobo, he went to, on to work with uh, Adobe Research. Now, Adobe does a lot more sort of back-end e-commerce, I think, than you would think Adobe does. Um, and they literally had item spaces in the hundreds of millions or billions. So they liked LRAC, but they couldn't use it as is. So during Subash's internship there, right, so let's, let's, let, let, let's look at the LRAC solution sort of from the empirical risk, min, the empirical risk min, 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 minimization perspective. We're trying to minimize, we're trying to use this, this, sim, this, sim, this similar matrix to project Q back to Q and to minimize that error. We're also going to regularize by the Frobenius norm of the similar, sim, similarity matrix. Okay? And we know just, you know, this is linear regression, or if we, if we squared error, then we know this is the standard linear regression closed form solution for S. Okay. However, S, you know, if you were doing item-based cloud filtering, you've got a billion items, S is a billion by billion. A billion might have been bad, but a billion by billion is even worse, right? A billion squared. So S is too big here, we can't do it. Uh, so let's first use the fast SVD to do a projection. Uh, so we're going to take Q and we're going to do the standard uh, SVD decomposition into U sigma V transpose. Uh, by the way, so if you want to do the SVD on a, uh, on a billion item matrix, you don't want to use NumPy, right? Uh, it's not going to work. Um, there are these randomized SVD methods which are absolutely beautiful. Basically pointing out that if you pass random vectors through a matrix, you still preserve most of the information. And then you can do a QR decomposition on, that, on, that, on, on, on those, uh, those random vector projections. If you do that, that gives you a fairly good approximation uh, of an SVD. And uh, you actually, if you're doing this in practice, Facebook has the best, most numerically stable uh, implementation. And this will do an SVD uh, on at least hundreds of millions of items, right? It's extremely impressive. So we can do SVD at scale. And now, rather than have, you know, use S to project Q directly, we're going we're to first use 
uh, v to project q down to a k-dimensional space. Right? So now s is only, instead of being item by item, it's now basically k is mapping a k-dimensional space back up to the item space. So it's k by i. That's much, much more tractable. Um, so we can still solve this in closed form. Right? It's just a little matrix algebra here, very similar to the standard solution. Uh, but we can even be a bit more clever, just go a few more steps. So note Q's definition here is the SVD. So let's just plug in Q's definition, right, U sigma V transpose. Okay. Now, you should already recognize V transpose V is orthonormal, or that uh, V is ortho orthonormal, so we get the identity when we multiply. So the Vs disappear. We go a bit further, and then we get the Us next to each other. They cancel. We get down to this solution for S. It is the inverse of an identity matrix and the sigma from the SVD, right? Is that easy or hard? It's a diagonal matrix, right? We only actually have to take the reciprocal of the diagonal elements, right? So this is no longer a full inverse. It's just a reciprocal. And the rest is just, ma is just matrix multiply. So uh, we work with Bronislaw of Kevaton at, at Adobe Research uh, on this work. And he just left for Google uh, probably a few months ago. But up, up until the time Bronislaw left, like, they were using this uh, uh, at Adobe uh, uh, quite effectively at scale because they could do state-of-the-art similar learning recommendation with the cost of basically a few matrix multiplies, right? Um, okay, finally, I mean, I'm getting near the end of the talk for those who've been overwhelmed with information. Uh, finally, uh, then my PhD student Wu Ga uh, picked up on this and he went to layer six this summer. And when he went to layer six, uh, they went back and revisited the fact that we turned all the zeros, uh, so all, all the question marks in our matrix, all the unobserved entries, to zeros. So when you train things like word to vec, right, you have this issue that you can't, you know, the zeros, the words that occur, right, we observe those, but the words that occur, the words, you know, pairs of words or contexts that don't occur, like that's almost, I mean, it's not infinite, but it's, it's extremely large. Uh, so if you know word vec, you know that they had this sort of subsample of the zeros uh, intelligently, and, and they derived methods from noise contrastive estimation. Uh, and so what Wuga and Layer 6 did is they went back and they, uh, instead of training uh, via standard linear regression, they would train, I'm uh, sorry, in, instead of doing the decomposition with SVD directly, uh, they used noise contrastive estimation to find the embeddings, right? And it turns out this gives way, way better embeddings uh, than, uh, than uh, doing the standard SVD. You know, and one answer is because actually, you know, all the zeros we imputed, right, they're not really zeros, right? We just didn't know what else to do with them. Uh, noise contrastive estimation does give you sort of slightly more principled way uh, to handle the zeros, especially in very sparse spaces uh, like embeddings. So uh, they improved on the embedding here. Uh, they get a different V. And that actually gave uh, substantially better results than what we were even getting uh, in 2017 with this work. OK, so that's under submission. Um, finally, Word Vector Institute, right? It would be probably a crime to come here and not talk about deep learning. So don't worry. Uh, we have autoencoder view of recommendation. And uh, therefore, that's going to give us a natural way to view uh, uh, rec recognition from a, a deep autoencoder perspective. OK, so this is my last slide. Um, OK, so we have a neural net here, right? This is, people should feel more comfortable now. Um, and uh, as input, so uh, for an item i, say 50 shades of gray, right, we're going to look at users 1 to m and say, did they purchase 50 shades of gray, right? So well, appropriately gray if they got it and white if they didn't. Um, and then we're going to sort of uh, also put this vector as the input, also as the output, right? This is an autoencoder. Uh, so this is going to be, uh, I think, user-based, uh, uh, the user-based autoencoder. If I instead looked at, um, for a, a user, all items, that would be the item-based autoencoder. So just like you get the item-based, user-based variance uh, in the previous work, you still get that in the neural network. But here, for every item, uh, I'm going to try to encode the user vector. I'm going to try to autoencode the user vector. And if you think of, if you think of projected LRAC, it was kind of saying, OK, we're going to fix the V and learn the W. It's to be a linear transform. Uh, 
But why was that the best thing to do? Why don't we learn V and W at the same time, and why don't we use nonlinear transforms? Does that work better? Absolutely. Right? OK. So it turns out that actually using a linear transform at the first layer, but sigmoid the second layer, uh, does give you the best RMSCs. Um, OK. Uh, this does share weights better than the previous uh, view of the linear approach. Uh, so you get a bit more generalization, which is very nice. Uh, and finally, at the time we published this paper, this is 2015, so it's already a bit old, uh, L. Lorma, which was this extremely complex uh, local matrix factorization approach, uh, was the best with the state of the art. And this simple autoencoder, like literally one hidden layer autoencoder, uh, was competitive with it uh, or, or beating it. Uh, in some cases, um, okay. But you'll say this is not okay. This is a neural network, but it's not a deep neural network. Can you go deep? At the time, of course, that was our goal in 2015, right? You know, we 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 want to have the first deep uh, deep recommendation method. We could not get deep to work. We tried very hard. We could never get deep to work better than a single layer. So this paper was just single layer. Uh, fortunately, um, okay. And you know, one problem was they were fitting. So some folks at NVIDIA, uh, they, have a, they have a publication last year, 2017. Uh, they picked up on, on, on this thing called AutoRec, right? autoencoding for recommendation. They point out a few things. First of all, that you need to use the LU or the CELLU as your nonlinear transform. For, for various reasons, they point out that works much better than, say, a RELU. If you go deep, you really have to use heavy dropout right, to prevent overfitting. And then they, 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 they had a third trick, which I probably would have told my student, no, don't ever do that. It's a bad idea. Uh, they call it dense refeeding. So you start off with a rather sparse input vector, but you can imagine that after you autoencode it, it's, it's going to become a bit more dense. So after they've trained the autoencoder close to convergence, they then start using the dense vector as a new input vector for continuing to train the autoencoder, which they call it dense refeeding. Now, for me, this is sort of like a fixed point that's kind of moving away from you, right? It seems very dangerous, uh, but they show that this, this actually does improve results. So I thought that was a very nice idea, something I definitely would not uh, have tried. Uh, so, uh, and they're getting some, of the, some, some state of the art results now uh, for deep recommendation. OK. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, right? And you, if you want to do collaborative filtering or recommendation, Turns out that autoencoders uh, are a very simple and very powerful approach. Um, uh, and they're quite effective, and, they're, and they can handle uh, information from, from multiple domains. Uh, and they make state-of-the-art uh, recommenders. So if you want these slides, send me an email, and I'll give you a PDF of the slides. Okay. Okay, thank you.